Center for opening up this space for us to conduct this panel with this lovely, uh, with our lovely guests here. And we will then introduce them later on. But I um, wanted to open it up to Karina Gold real quick um, to do the opening. And then afterwards, I'll introduce uh, one of the members of the Health Center to just give us a little background of why we're here and what's going on. Yeah. Um, good evening, relatives. My name is Karina, and I come from the Confederated Villages of Lashon. Many people know us as Ohlone. We are on the East Bay side of the what is now the San Francisco Bay area. And I was um, asked to come and do a welcoming for our esteemed guest, Raizizi. And in our territory, it's always a good way to do that. We are in Yalamu, which is the traditional territory of the Wunatush speaking Ohlone people. When we were all um, colonized by the Spanish, they kind of saw us all as one people. We we're actually eight different groups of people with eight different languages and eight different creation stories. Our songs and dances are different. And the leader of the Romatush people is Jonathan Cordero. And Jonathan bids you welcome to his land, um, although he is a doctor and he teaches at the Lutheran School in Southern California. He often can't make it to his own territory to do these important welcomings. And so he um, asked that I could do this for him. And so I'm, it's, I'm honored to do that for my elders that are here traveling such a long way and on this important um, important journey to talk about the waters. Um, in our way, when people came to visit our lands, we would often have people stop at the edge of territories. And at that time, they would send up a smoke signal. Not a fire, but just a smoke, until people were able to get there to see them. And when we saw guests that were arriving to our villages, we would send runners out to greet them. And while the runners were out there greeting, then they would, people in the village would get together food and gifts and get ready for all the good things that were going to happen. It was never a time of talking about business before all that occurred. The runners would bring the guests up and they would be welcomed with food and gambling and storytelling and gifts. Once all of that happened, then, the, then our guests would be asked, what, what is the reason why you're on our territory? Why do you want to cross our land? Sometimes it would be to gather medicine, sometimes to get to the other side, sometimes it was to visit relatives, Sometimes it was to tell an important story that needed to be told. But all of these things happen in its own time. It's not like today when you step off the bus or the bar or the airplane in San Francisco and then all of a sudden you're busy running to wherever you are. This place has names and it has ancestors under the ground and it has a whole history of who people were and still are. And so on behalf of the Romatish people and the Ohlone nations, I welcome you and honor you for being here in our territory. And in that way, I have some gifts for you. So it's easy to help us. Mm -hmm. offer you medicine, and medicine that was picked in our territory um, that is from this area, and it's cedar and mugwort, and mugwort's our medicine that we give here, so it was created in smudge sticks, and I'd like to offer that to you. Chochenyo language on the East Bay side, 
It says, Sigi Uti Isha, and that means water is life. And this is our basket design, which is a very old basket design. Our baskets aren't with us anymore. They're in Russia. And so this basket design was taken from that <coughs> pattern that is now in Russia. So our baskets aren't with us anymore. Um, they're in Russia or in, in London. And hopefully this summer, um, some of our family members are going to go out and greet them. And it hasn't been done for quite a while and to sing them songs again. Mm -hmm. So I want to offer you this as well. to take time to do the things in a right way, right? <clears throat> so these are, these are uh, necklaces that were given to me by a good friend of mine, um, Kim Dale Camper, which some of you might know. She's a Miwok woman who um, supports so many things and is an activist and a warrior herself. Um, and runs the uh, spirit organization in, um, in Vallejo. And she makes me these necklaces, and it's always, a, it's always a beautiful thing that happens is that she, I'll see her every so often, a few months, and then she'll hand me a bunch of necklaces to give out to people. The necklaces she's made have gone to Hawaii, New Zealand, to the very top of the Arctic, to, uh, to uh, Aotearoa, to, uh, to Australia, to many different places in the world. And it's our connection um, with these beads, with the abalone that's in them, with the pine nuts that feed us, that remind us of what our reciprocity is, our relationality to each other as indigenous people and as indigenous women and grandmas. I'm so happy to be able to do this on behalf of our people. So I'd like to offer you this to you. Thank you for coming. My name is Tokapiwi, um, Senator of the Camp Woman. 
I think his name is Karen Littleman, and I'm a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. And I also resided at the Oak 50 Shuckling Camp and the Treaty um, Camp in Seneca. Oh. Good evening. My name is Madonna Lehawk. I come here with a, I greet you with a heartfelt handshake. Um, I'm back to Scully in Montreal. My name is White Day Woman. My name is English, English, Naval, and Eagle Hunter. And I'm a real honor for me to be here representing the people at home. And I'd um, like to give this time to one of the representatives of the San Francisco Native American Health Center. Um, thank you for letting them host us and they'll share some words. Thank you. Uh, honored to be here. I'm Aurora Mamea, uh, Oki, uh, Nikosowatz, Nitanuko, um, Nitanuku, Matominskiaki. I'm from the Anskapi Tibetan Blackfeet Nation. Um, I worked here at the American Health Center for over 20 years, and uh, I'm here at this department in the last year and a half overseeing the Youth Suicide Prevention Grant and the Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Grant. Um, and so we're honored to have you here. Um, I wanted to introduce Amanda White Crane, who is the site director um, here at this site. And um, we we're excited to hear, you know, that you were looking for a space, and um, we're honored to host and uh, welcome everyone. Hi, I'm Amanda White Crane. I'm Northern Cheyenne from Lindner, Montana. I've been the um, site director here for eight months, um, and I just love having it full with people. Um, and I want to apologize. I know we have limited space right here, but um, we have a wonderful basement uh, set up as well. So I just want to apologize to everybody in the basement. I wish we had more space. Um, and I just wanted to really invite everybody to the round dance tomorrow, and we're just so happy that you're here and we have prayers and um, you know, hope that hopefully this night kind of um, uh, mobilizes people to come tomorrow and just really support every the work that you're doing. So really honored that you guys are here with us. Can you tonight. tell us where the round dance is? Uh, the round dance is tomorrow at San Francisco State. Uh, it starts at 5.30 p.m. Uh, singing starts at 7. Um, we have uh, flyers out front. It's uh, in the back area of the campus at uh, Annex 1. And uh, the flyers are out front will be at the address. Actually, the address on there says Hallway Ave, but we're also on Facebook, Native American Health Center. Uh, and there's an address on there, 1 North State Drive. If you put that into your map, uh, it'll take you right there. Um, 1 North State Drive. And I know last year with the hallway address, a lot of people got lost, um, but we make sure we put that up there, um, the address. One North State Drive map will take you there, and we'll have signs up all over the campus as well. And uh, just a little history behind the round dances, uh, for those that might not know, um, this is our fourth annual here at the Native American Health Center, and um, our theme is healing from uh, trauma and violence in our communities. Um, we have a youth program here, as well as an adult program. Uh, this is under the Behavioral Health Department. We do uh, prevention, culture is prevention. So we do um, arts and crafts, speaking on Mondays, we do talking circles, we do drum group here for uh, adults and youth. And we have an annual water walk where we've um, worked under Mona Stonefish, um, Dr. Mona Stonefish up in Canada, who comes down and uh, leads it for us. Uh, we're on about our, I think, sixth year now. And it'll be taking place in May. And our, this is our fourth annual round dance. and. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to think of another. We have a few other ceremonies that we do throughout the year for our youth, like uh, wiping of the tears. And the round dance is for, um, it's a Cree ceremony, and uh, we'll have uh, 12 singers, um, guest singers, out here from across the nation uh, and Canada, out here. And uh, the background and history of the round dance is um, for those who are suffering from grief and loss from a loved one, loss of a loved one. And it's a, a ceremony, a time when uh, we can come together and be with um, the spirit of our loved one through this ceremony and it was given to um, a young um, woman who lost her mother um, and she couldn't let go of her mother and so um, 
her mom came to her in a, in a dream and told her to sing these songs and have this round dance ceremony. And during this time, um, we can be together during this round dance. Um, but you have to, you know, let, let me go. We can't keep holding on to those that crossed over. And so it takes place in the winter time because winter time is a time when uh, people get lonely and fall into depression. And so um, that's what that's about. And so um, they'll have an opening song where they call the spirits in protocol. And then at the end, they'll have the closing song where they um, send them back. So, and one of the rules of the round dance is that uh, no mother should carry their, uh, their children when they're dancing. Um, but they can hold their hand when they're dancing. So yeah, we hope to see you there tomorrow. Thank you. I was mentioning earlier, this is my first time uh, moderating a panel, so please excuse me of my nervousness. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just start off by, again, uh, briefly introducing uh, those up here on our panel, um, you know, giving short bios, and then I'll get into some of the questions that I had set for them. And then afterwards, we'll talk, we can uh, open this up to the audience if they have any questions. Uh, for our panelists and then give you updates about, you know, reminding you about the events that are happening locally and how to get involved in such a way. So Joy Braun is a wife, a mother, grandmother. She's a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and frontline community organizer with Indigenous Environmental Network. Braun has been a staunch protector and defender in her homeland, first fighting the Keystone XL Pipeline Project, later the first of the two campers at the camp at Sacred Stone Camp on August, April 1st, 2016, staying until the no dapple camps were forcibly evicted. She continued her stand to protect the water, land, and the sacred. And we move on to Karen Little Wounded. She is a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe of South Dakota. She's a sister, auntie, mother, grandmother, and educator, and a protector of the Unsi Maka, Mother Earth, water protector and former resident of the Osheti Sakon camp and 1851 treaty camp of 2016. There's Madonna Thunderhawk, who is also from the Cheyenne River uh, Sioux Reservation. She is a veteran and she's a veteran, excuse me, she's a veteran of every modern Native American struggle from the occupation of Alcatraz to the 1973 siege of Wounded Knee and the ongoing resistance movement of Standing Rock. She currently serves as a tribal liaison of the Lakota Law Project, excuse me, the Lakota People's Law Project, uh, in fighting the illegal removal under the Indian Child Welfare Act and Native American children from tribal nations into the state foster care system. She is in the, she is the central figure in the upcoming feature documentary, Warrior Woman, directed by Elizabeth Castle. Mabel Ann is a great grandmother, Lakota Dakota Band, Great Sioux Nation from South Dakota, Iron Lightning Community, Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, lifelong activist beginning with the takeover of Alcatraz in 1969, founder, founding <coughs> member of Women of All Red Nations and the Black Hills Alliance. She's also a founding and active member of the, oh gee, how, um, Thank you. Mashagia Nashin, uh, Grandmother Standing Strong. Thank you. Member of the Osheti Sakoan Camp, Treaty Land and of North Dakota. So I wanted to start off uh, with a question based towards Madonna real quick. As co-founder of the Women of All Red Nations, you stood up and spoke on behalf of the harms that were being done to our Native women from sterilization uh, to the children being taken away from our families and tribes, along with the destruction and harms that were being done and continue to uh, be done to our Mother Earth from mining and fracking uh, contaminations. From your experiences and involvement from early on, is there a difference in the struggles that we are facing today? And if so, what are some of those? Excuse me, I have laryngitis. Oh. Um, so I'm just, anyway, I'll give it a good go. Um, you know, I don't see much of a difference. The issues are the same. Because we're a land-based people, 
or indigenous to this land. Our issues are going to be the same. We're going to have to confront the greed of this modern day world, each generation. I, the good I see is that from what, how we had to organize back in our day, and all we had was snail mail and mimeograph machines. <laughs> Young people don't understand that. But. <laughs> so nowadays, it's this modern technology. And the modern technology is helping things happen instantly. And a good example is what happened at Standing Rock. The young people, our young person that's here, Joseph Haggis, was instrumental with the young people to organize that. And the initial gathering of that. And the result was the world came to standing up thanks to the social media and internet. And all our people, indigenous people from all over Turtle Island came from Central South America to Alaska. So that's the only difference I see it, is that the instant communication. Our struggles remain the same, and it's up to us as elders to support. Because when we were young, we had the support of our elders. Those elders in our day that had the memory of the Battle of the Big Horn. So we learned from them that when we become elders, we have status. And that status means we have to strong, stand strong behind our young people. Thank you. And for Joy, as I mentioned in your bio, you know, you were one of the first campers to camp at Sacred Stone Camp in April 2016, defending and protecting our water. But we understand that it hasn't stopped there. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little about the other camps that you helped at, such as Lois La Vie, which we will give an update as well. This is a really exciting update that we found out. The so Lois La Vie is a um, resistance camp that's based out in Louisiana to stop the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. And um, as I was mentioning, you know, can you give us a little bit of an update on you know, the different camps that you visited at and that are currently residing at as well? Thank you, Izzy. So I'm just going to go ahead and break the news. So Lois La Vie, which means water is life down Louisiana, they got granted a temporary injunction to halt the Bayou Bridge Pipeline today. And I'm going to get a little teary-eyed. Because I went down to Bayou Bridge uh, at the invitation of Sharif Lakeland and um, went along the route by the bridge earlier or later last year, and um, met the people of St. James, which is where Bayou Bridge is slated to end, a little, little tiny area. Uh, met the Uma Nation from the people. Um, got to meet a lot of people along the route. And uh, my heart's really happy. Especially on this day of days. Because last year, Last year they came in, and it wasn't just with rubber bullets. A lot of people didn't understand what you guys were watching on, on the videos. That was light ammunition that they came in with. Some of them had rubber bullets, some of them had new days. But they goose stepped in with light ammunition on it. And we left El Chempe and Rosebud, and then I don't know why I was in the 27th. <laughs> and then on the 27th, they came in to a sacred storm in Jesus' nest. And the last camp, which we had set up to be there for those that were living in Chapi, which was Baku, on our seventh generation rising. So when you ask what camps that we've been involved in, the very first camp we did, um, Joseph was there. We were trying to protect the buffalo. Um, our own land, so Shine River. And we were camping in winter. We didn't have teepees or yurts. 
They were sleeping in our cars with the buffalo. <laughs> Um, we did end up protecting our buffalo. What year was that? It was like 2010. 2010. 2010. December 2010. I had just gotten back to Shine River. And then um, we started fighting Houston XL. And a lot of you heard about the camp at Rosebud uh, camp. Well, there was two other camps that happened in South Dakota. There was a camp at Kulitasha, our lower pool, and then there was the frontline camp at Cheyenne River. Keystone XL Pipeline plans to go less than a mile from the borders of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, which is my homeland. Should Keystone XL break, it will take 33 minutes for it to hit our water intake. Now, for those of you that watch the news, you know from the Freeman spill, and the spill up by um, Sister Wapperton earlier that it took a lot longer than 30 minutes for them to notice that there was a spill. That's part of the reason why we were fighting the court access. The grassroots people in Standing Rock had called when they realized that the um, court access had been moved from Bismarck to just north of Standing Rock. And um, there was a meeting with Colonel Henderson, who was with the Army Corps of Engineers, and they called and said, can you guys come and help? And I remember talking on Facebook to Joseph and to some of the other youth at Cheyenne River and saying, hey, these guys are calling for help, you want to go up there? And they said, yeah. Because the thing is, I don't really move on things unless I get direction from the youth. Because it isn't us older ones that are going to move the world. It's them. And so if the youth are behind something, then I'm going to stand behind that. And so the youth said, yeah, let's go. So we went up. And I think that was the first time they, they ever encountered like signs and a bullhorn. And <laughs> Introduce that this <laughs> Um. So yeah, on April 1st, there was a horse ride that went into um, Campbell from 48th. And we opened camp at St. Crystal. And um, we were sitting at Mikey Beach. It was snowy, it was slushy, it was cold. And uh, I moved in. And then my cousin, Wiaka Eagleman from Rosebud, um, saw that I was going to end up being camping there by myself. And he said, no. <laughs> so then he, he stayed still. So it was me and Gaka. And Unicorn Riot. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorn Riot. Lorenzo spent the night in his minivan. <laughs> so Lorenzo was saying he was there. Um, but other camps, of course, when, when we originally had what we first called the Overflow Camp, which eventually became the Ocheki Shakoi Camp. End of August, I moved over there. There was too many people around my teepee, and I couldn't move my teepee poles anymore. So I moved over to Ocheti, Shakoi Town. And then we moved into Treaty Town. Treaty Town, 1851 Treaty Town, which was in the direct path of the Code Access Pipeline. And of course, you guys know that we were raided on October 27th. Um, before all of that, when we were originally fighting Keystone Excel, of course, there was potato spy down in Cheyenne River. Uh, since we lost camp, um, Cheyenne River State Tribal Chairman Harold Frazier asked that when we were being evicted, he offered the water protectors a place to come to so that they could move on but be safe because they didn't have anything. It, and he offered our Palo grounds, our YGP grounds. And then Chairman Frazier asked me to be a liaison between the water protectors and, and him. So for a year, I've been taking care of water protectors as they come and go, um, helping them go through the different emotions 
that we've had to go through, um, just kind of helping in whatever way we possibly could. When the water protectors first arrived in Eagle Butte, they, um, a lot of them didn't have socks, they didn't have extra clothes, we had so many, so much, everything had to be left behind. And so we've done everything that we could to make sure that they had what they needed. Um, Loy Levy, Sheree asked us if I help consult with them. I haven't consulted with the Line 3 camps. Um, there's three of them in Minnesota. There's um, White Pine Camp. There um, was another camp down in Texas for a while. And that was the Trans Pecos Pipeline. Another energy transfer partner project. Um, there was a camp over in Michigan against the Rover Pipeline. Again, another energy transfer partner project. Um, consulted with some of them. So I kind of end up as, as being a frontline community organizer. I end up going to different places. And it's not always just against pipelines. You also have like the LNG in, in Tacoma, liquid natural gas. Huge operation, almost as big as the Tacoma Dome, that should it explode would be this huge, worse than Hiroshima, worse than Nagasaki. And you know what? I've been to Hiroshima and I've been to Nagasaki. And I've seen what that devastation causes. And I can't imagine what this would do. And we know that. LNG plants do explode. We know that. Um, the pipeline to that particular one goes um, less than 30 feet from a daycare. And less than 50 feet from an uh, elementary school. So we have to be vigilant. We have to watch what's going on all around us. But I'm really excited about By Your Bridge. That's just like, the best news that could happen today. <laughs> yeah, that's on October 23rd, <laughs> right? And um, when we moved in, you know, our, our tribal chairman was there, Harold Fraser, who, you know, fortunately he's a water protector and he hung in there with us, you know, up in Standing Rock. And uh, yeah, it was on October 23rd, and uh, he spoke to us, and we walked across the road, and cut the fence, and we walked in. And it was the most amazing feeling, it was the most beautiful feeling, to be back on our homeland. And uh, you know, we were there for four days. Camp, you know, in prayer to living that Ocheti Shakoi was a beautiful way of life. You know, we got a very uh, small taste of what our ancestors went through and lived through. <clears throat> it was a struggle because not only did we have to fight Apple, but we had to survive there. And uh, I also worked in uh, a kitchen, you know, when we were, there wasn't any action or, you know, that went on this kitchen. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of things to do there. Um, you know, on the day of the raid, um, the night before, on the 26th, we had a camp meeting. And uh, the camp coordinator asked what we wanted to do. And we decided to, you know, a group of us form a prayer circle. And um, because that's what it was about being prayerful and peaceful. <clears throat> so we expected them that night. Actually, my partner took me back to Ochitisha going and said, um, you know, one of us has to 
you know, we'd be out here and, and because we knew we were going to be arrested. And so reluctantly, I was like, okay. <laughs> so he took me back to Ocheti Shakoi, but you know, it just didn't feel right. <laughs> so my friend, uh, I have a little Havasupai brother, and uh, he came and he said, uh, we need to go over there. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And so we went to the front gate. I'm like, well, if this is meant to be, you know, we'll make it back over to tree camp. And just then this old truck pulled in the front gate and said, anybody need a ride to treaty camp? <laughs> so there we were, we jumped in. And we went back to treaty camp. And, uh, you know, we stayed all night. We stayed up all night. We took shifts because we were expecting them. So we got up in the morning, you know, it was a beautiful morning. We Every morning we got up and we prayed to Creator. We sang to Creator. And we had, you know, our brothers, the buffalo, living right next to us. <clears throat> so, we began in the morning with, you know, prayer and song, and then we made breakfast, and then we, you know, packed up the truck because, you know, they said uh, if we parked in the ditches that they wouldn't touch our vehicles. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you said a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. 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 So about 10.30, you know, they started, on, well, before that, but, you know, that's when I first heard the sirens and all that, and, you know, watching them set up along uh, the hillsides, and it got to be a routine thing, just like, you know, conducting surveillance, always looking over the horizon, you know, seeing if the white trucks are there, and, and uh, so they came, they came in and we formed our prayer circle. A group of us about, almost 30 of us. And all the while we could see them coming in to treaty camp, you know, throwing tents aside, you know, all, all this stuff happening to our people. And in the back, you know, we could hear all of that going on and you know by the time evening came we were the only ones left there and we were surrounded there was a you know a law enforcement officer from across the country you know and uh, so they had us surrounded there at prayer camp and uh, I think there was like a hundred and close to 130 that got arrested that day 141 and um, so they, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to jail anyway. So I'm like, well, I'm ready to go. You guys were supposed to be here last night. You know, do this already. <laughs> so they took me and two young ladies that um, were with me and we stood up and they took us. Eventually they brought everybody else out and, uh, you know, they had us in the ditches, all zip tied up, <coughs> and uh, then they put us on these school buses and hauled us to Mandan, Morton County. They were the ones they put in dog kennels, were the ones they rode on our arms. Like I said, it was a beautiful way of life. It was for Mother Earth. It was for the water. And I would do it again. Opila. Mini Michoni. Oh. Uh, it was very beautiful, very powerful. And, um, you know, I just want to take that moment to just really soak in all of that intense information, those intense stories, you know, that need to be shared, you know, with all of us who. Um, you know, probably haven't made it up there to Standing Rock or aren't really aware with what has been going on. You know, these are the true stories that we're listening to, that we're sitting next to in the same room, sharing the same space with each other. Um, and, you know, again, it's such an honor to be able to sit up here and to have these conversations and to bring that awareness to our Native people and to all of our allies to, you know, find that support to find you you know, really stand up and, 
you know, get into action to our most capacity. And I wanted to move forward to, um, you know, the whole reason as to why why you all are here. You know, the yesterday we had a letter delivery up to Wells Fargo, and um, for some background history, during the Standing Rock movement, still continuous, a divestment movement had blossomed from that. And it's to bring awareness to not just DAPL itself, but to the companies who are liable for letting those projects be possible. So Energy Transfer Partner, along with other banks who approve these projects to go through, all while there was no official consent or consultation for the tribal people to approve construction to happen. And so lots of this research was done um, on which banks are funding pipelines like DAPL, Keystone XL Pipeline, Line 3, Trans Mountain, Bayou Bridge Pipeline, and many more. And on Mazaska Talks, Mazaska is the Lakota word for money. So on Money Talks, or mazaskatalks.org, there's a list where there's actually 17 primary banks that are heavily <coughs> invested in all four of those pipelines uh, that I had listed. And there's a general list of 62. It, it used to be 63, but I think it was BNP Bank had actually divested from fossil fuels. And that was millions and millions of dollars. And so banks like Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, Citibank, Chase, um, Bank of America, Barclay, TD Bank, you know, I could list all these other banks out loud, but like I said, you can go on mazaskatalks.org and you can see that huge list of which ones are uh, funded and how much, there's billions, billions of dollars that these, these banks, these corporations are invested heavily into making these projects happen. And on Thursday morning, um, we had the grandmothers, including uh, Pat St. Ange, who's with I Don't Know More, SF Bay. They went uh, and to deliver this letter. And it wasn't just about, um, you know, it wasn't just about their investment about DAPL, but they had recently pushed out a statement um, on November 29th, 2017, Wells Fargo announced a grant program that would, that would provide $50 million over the next five years to help address the economic, social, and environmental needs of American and Alaskan Native communities. At the same time, <coughs> Wells Fargo agreed to extend two credit facilities totaling $1.5 billion for Canadian oil corporations. Trans Canada to build the Keystone XL pipeline. And the Keystone XL pipeline has been a contentious issue for indigenous communities, both here in the United States. For a decade, indigenous communities, leaders, and activists had fought the Keystone XL pipeline project in November 2015, um, which was victorious in stopping the project. However, since the inauguration of our president, the pipeline had been revitalized but so has the movement to stop the pipeline. By urging and putting pressure on the pipeline's uh, investors to divest, and indigenous leaders and activists hope that another victory can be won. And so I'm wondering if Madonna, if you would like to share a few words on what that experience was like uh, with delivering the letter and just the conversation that was done, and then I'll pass it on to you as well. Um, well, basically, I think it was really important. But at my age and being through everything all these years, um, you look at things like that in different perspective. Is that everything helps and everything counts, no matter how small or large because you keep coming back, you keep coming back on whatever level and however amount of commitment you have because they're not gonna go away. 
so we can't. So whatever happens on whatever level is really important. And I'm so, you know, glad that my sister and I got the chance to come out here and be involved, you know, so that, because um, we have Wells Fargo at home, you know, South Dakota. They're pushing, trying to be everywhere. And they're probably going to come to our tribal council because our tribal council, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, is the only one still in the fight, officially. So we know they're going to come knocking on our door. So um, everything's important, and it's just part of the long struggle. And I mean, for myself, because I know, you know, you, your commitment means you're in it for the long haul, you know. And these types of actions are, are important because they need to know, those corporate uh, moguls need to know, and we're not going away either. And today, I just wanted to briefly uh, mention, we were out here earlier at about 11, 12 o'clock, um, because the um, dirt, Diablo Rising Tide, one of our ally um, teams or ally friends, had organized a direct action right, right outside of Citibank. Uh, to be in alignment with the week worth of um, direct actions to be in solidarity to stop the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. And although it was a small number of us, I say about 15, 20 of us, you know, we still made a huge statement just by standing out there, by waking up and making that our mission to be outside, you know, for that short amount of time. And for all the hundreds of people who walked past us, you know, we planted a seed, you know, in their minds and in their hearts to see, you know, it's important for us to stand out there, as Madonna was saying, you know, it's important for us to take that action in whatever way we can, because, you know, each struggle, it just continues on layer by layer. And we have to do something to, you know, put that block right in front of it to stop it. You know, to make it turn around, because we don't we don't need those struggles anymore. We don't want those struggles anymore, especially for us young people. And I actually wanted to give a quick shout out to Joseph White Eyes, who is behind us recording uh, for Indigenous Rising Media. For those, for those of you who don't know, Joseph was one of the young people who actually ran thousands of miles from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe to the Dakota, uh, excuse me, to DC, you know, to deliver that letter to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. So let's give a big O. And, um, you know, it's really exciting to be able to part, to be part of actions like this, you know, that really uplift, that uplifts our spirits and to making these connections with all the people who are around us. And I wanted to ask all of you, um, let's see, how can we encourage tribal members, leaders, or councils to not accept funds, you know, from these big banks that are trying to bribe, of, bribe us with their money? Um, yeah, so maybe Mabel Ann, if you'd like to share some words. Before I share some words, I'd like to Oh, thank the young woman here for giving a, giving us that traditional welcome and permission to be on your land, Lila Wopila. Um, we know that eventually that's what's going to happen. And we know there's going to be people on our tribal governments that are going to want to accept. But as community grassroots people, that's what I am and mentioned our group, the grandmother standing strong. And that's our responsibility as elders, I feel, to encourage our young people to organize against them and the reasons why. And it can happen 
we were talking about, you know, our old style of grassroots organizing back in the day. You know, a lot of our people at home, the grassroots people, they don't even have cell phones, a lot of and internet, water, you know, electricity. water, electricity, things like that. So it's still going to take some of those old tactics that we used back in the day. Mm -hmm. and, and as elders now, like I said, that's, that's, that's what we do. That's our responsibility. Encourage the young people and tell them. Help them with the, the organizing. Because as a group, all you have to do, you know, is bring that to the council and say, no, you know, we, you're not accepting. That's not going to happen. You know, and so I'm, real, I'm really thankful that I've even reached this age. I'm going to be 75 next month. And I'm thankful to be here to see something like Ocheti Shankoy. <laughs> All our young, our, our young people, but the people that came from all the different nations, indigenous people, and the allies that came. I mean, I'm so fortunate to live to see that again. That kind of, you know, solidarity and everybody standing up. And it wasn't about, you know, being white and being Indian, whatever. We were all doing it as an elder, walking through that camp, having everybody so positive and up. That did my heart so, you know, it, I just I just can't even explain the feeling. And like I said, I couldn't even carry a, a little bag very far and we come swooping in on me. Let me help you, Grandma. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, we, as as elders, we stayed back, just died to go to the front line. But we did want to, to take the focus away. Everybody would have been worried about us and our safety. So we stayed back, we prayed, and we were there to give advice. So many young people came to us. And they knew as elder women that they felt comfortable in doing that. And they would give us anything they had. It was beautiful, and they'd ask for advice. And of course, we'd give that advice, and everybody, we'd encourage them, you know. And especially the, well, people of all ages, but the young people. And that's what I, I was sharing with Joseph, and with the two of the young ladies that, that came with us, you know, you guys, you're the ones we've been waiting for. You know, really. I just think Joseph, when he started that, they started. And like she shared, people came. Thousands of people came to help us. And I want to say, Lila Pilama, to all of our, our support that we have and the allies that we have, we could have never done that without the support of the people. That the people may live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so Trans Canada, when they first came around uh, Cheyenne River, they, they we, we passed a resolution on a tribal resolution that Trans Canada and Enbridge are not allowed on the Cheyenne River Sioux the tribal exterior boundaries at all. It's illegal. Also, we extended that eventually to include energy transfer partners as well. But at the time, it was Trans Canada. And um, they decided that they were going to sneak in and go to Takini, where they originally wanted to do. They originally wanted to go through our reservation. So they, they were going to have this meeting at Takini. And we saw a meeting about KXL, 
on Takini, and we had already passed this resolution. We originally thought that it was an organizing meeting against KXL. Well, then we found out that it was Trans Canada. Well, we called down to Takini and said, you can't do that, that's against the law. So they canceled that meeting and they eventually went up to Faith, South Dakota, which is just off of our reservation. Well, we found out about that and we organized people, made phone calls, got on the internet, and um, we eventually all ended up in Faith, South Dakota. Well, Trans Canada had all these donuts and and all this food, all these donuts out there, like they were going to try to buy us off a of donut. In that meeting, in that meeting, they, it came to light that they were trying to buy off people in bikini with um, Tempur-Pedic mattresses. <laughs> well, we were going to be bought off with donuts and mattresses. The reason why I, I mention this is because this $50 million grants that Wells Fargo is offering to our indigenous communities is like those donuts and those Tempur-Pedic mattresses. Because if you take that, and by the way, we didn't eat any of those donuts. Um, and we definitely didn't take any mattresses. But it, it's like offering this bone, this, this carrot, saying, here, we'll give you a little bit of this because we know you want to do language revitalization. You know we want to do something with the youth. You know, these types of things. But it, they're, they're saying, you know, we'll just give you this little piece. But in the meanwhile, offering $1.5 billion line of credit to Trans Canada. Imagine what we could do with $1.5 billion. Not just on reservations, but out in places like here, San Francisco, Seattle, Houston. New York, Miami, we could do a lot with that. So what we did in that letter is we, we told Wells Fargo <coughs> that they had until April. And, and the reason why we said April is because April is when they have their shareholders meeting. Now usually they don't really announce where or time until about two weeks before they send out letters. Well, Wells Fargo, you're, you've been served notice. <laughs> as far as encouraging our youth, the, our youth have so much energy and there's so many ideas. If you're willing to sit down and listen without preconceived ideas and notions, if you're willing to sit down and actually Listen with an open heart and an open mind, because they're going to take you in directions you never thought possible. They ran from what Paula to Mowbridge. Okay, cool. And then they wanted to run to Omaha, Nebraska. All right, cool. It wasn't long after that. They said, we're going to run to Washington, D.C. And I was like, all righty. <laughs> Here you go. Youth, if you listen to them and they sit down and, and they, they tell you where they want you to go and what they want to do, So my biggest advice is for us is to throw away your preconceived notions and your preconceived ideas. Because we carry a lot of baggage with us. We have to learn to throw that baggage away. And we have to learn to open our hearts and open our minds to what is possible. Because I guarantee what they come up with, what those youth come up with, are things you've never thought of before in your life. And this is my last question. And then I'll open it up to the public. 
and I'm sure that most of us are dying to know do to support you all, probably financially and probably actively as well. You know, how can we, what can we do to help, you know, these many camps that are building up? Um, you know, uh, with the Lakota Law Project, you know, there's the um, donation to fund for uh, Holyoke Lafferty and Chase Iron Eyes, um, you know, for their trial. You know, how can we, what can we donate or what can we do to offer our efforts and our time um, and our energy out here in the Bay Area for you all? So, unlike Standing Rock, that got a lot of donations down here on Sioux Tribe, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe did not get millions of dollars. They did not even get thousands of dollars. You can go to pawashday.com and you can donate to the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe for the legal. Because they, they literally have been taking money out of the general fund help fund this and the lawyers right now are in the red and they need help we need to pay for that we cannot continue to take away from general fund our people don't have enough money for propane our people don't have enough money to get to doctor's appointments off the reservation <laughs> our people go hungry our elderly their their waters get shut off their electricity gets shut off we can't, we have to still be able to take care of our people. And the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe does not have a casino. The Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe is, it goes back and forth between Zeebok County and Pine Ridge, Oglala, about who's the poorest county in the nation. So we don't have a lot of funds, we don't have a casino, we don't have that kind of revenue. So I would highly encourage people to go to wakpawashday.com. W-A-K-P-A-W-A-S-T-E.com. Wakpawashday.com. And support the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. Literally, if, that, if there's nothing else that you can do, do that. Because our lawyers need to get paid. Most of them are Cheyenne River Sioux Tribal members. They're amazing, powerful lawyers, still fighting Dakota Access, but also fighting Keystone XL and the gold mining in the Black Hills, which is happening right now. So we're in three major water fights, and we need help. The tribe needs help. And you could also go on lakotalaw.org. Lakotalaw.org uh, to donate. Is there anything else? Okay, I think questions out in the public. All right. Uh, thank you so much for um, being here and coming to share all this great information. I do a radio show, so I've been following this and announcing it and talking to people. I know that we've been doing shows on the um, Child Welfare Act and all the different things, and I've met some of you before. But I just wanted to say that a lot of people don't know the history, and they don't know their own history. And um, there was something that the government did called the Indian Claims Commission where they were going to give Indian tribes money for their land because they did admit that they had done wrong. And so they offered the Lakota Nation a major amount of money. And the Lakota people are the only ones that never accepted money for the land. And I just have to say that because you embody in your ongoing efforts, the, the value of the land over money. So I just wanted to say that and to say thank you all. And, and we, we know about that, <laughs> but that's 
large in part, part of the reason why we said that it was on unceded treaty territory because we never took the money for that 1851 unceded treaty territory that we were fighting on with Dakota. I just want to say it was such an honor to be with all of you at Standing Rock. I mean, um, it was a really remarkable experience for me. I just want to make a comment, then I'm going to ask a question. But you're talking about how incredible it was when I first got there, and um, I came over the hill and I looked down at uh, Ocheti, and I saw the teepees and the smoke, and I thought I was going back 200 years. I couldn't believe it. I just started to cry before I even went into camp. I was overwhelmed with the beauty and in the morning before the sun came up you'd hear woo woo throughout the camp. You'd hear this this echoing, this calling each other and then you'd hear around six o'clock Guy Dull Knife and uh, Frank Sosi, you know, Sosi saying, wake up relatives, wake up with the sun, wake up, we're not on vacation here. Um, it was really, really inspiring. Um, and I was there on the 22nd and got arrested and was thrown in a dog kennel, and not fed, not given, read my Miranda rights, um, not allowed to make a phone call, which is my right. So if you think you're an American, you think you've got rights, you better think again, because you don't. And uh, I was told that, you know, criminals don't have any rights. And I said, look, I'm not, number one, I'm not a criminal, and even if I were, I still have my rights. And she said, we keep talking like that, you're never gonna get your phone call. So, you know, this is the way it was. But my question is to you, and people ask me this all the time, what's happened to Standing Rock? What, was, what, was there anything that was accomplished that, that people need to know about? Um, I think it was you or LaDonna said, we were like seeds that were spread from the wind. Uh, and I also heard that there were, was a three and a half trillion dollar divestment from banks around the world. Is that about a right number? And just tell us a little bit about that. What has been accomplished from standing up in your opinion? Standing Rock was not a defeat. Don't ever let anybody ever try to tell you that. We won. And the reason why we won at Standing Rock is because we were told in ceremony that we were to take the fire home. And that once you took that fire home, you, you, needed, you needed to take that fire home. You need to, to continue carrying the cry of Minnie wherever you are. And now you see people from New Zealand and Australia and the middle of Africa and in the middle of Russia and England and, and even Thailand and, and Japan crying out Lakota words, Mini Wichoni. And all across the nation and all over the world, it's not just Mini Wichoni, it's not just water is life, it's the realization that we're all connected. It's the realization that, that, that there's social injustices happening and that we have the right, we have not only the right, but we have the responsibility to stand up. And you see that happening with the youth and these all over the world. And so, That's the power of prayer. As far as divestment, there's been a lot of divestment. The World Bank pulled out of fossil fuels, um, funding fossil fuels, that was a huge thing. Um, Wells Fargo is closing 40 of its branches, largely due to divestment. Um, so divestment works. I still, I'm calling out National Congress of American Indians because you have not divested from Wells Fargo. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that till you guys do that. Because uh, President Keeler, divest. I told you this when I went to NCAI last year, that this needed to happen. And I told you guys back then not to put your hands, not to be shaking hands with the Army Corps of Engineers and all the rest of them, but you guys are doing it anyway. So NCAI, divest. 
the, that that brings us into the whole other thing. You know, if your 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 unions or your your um, trade organizations or whatever organizations you're involved in, whatever it is you do, whether it's your church organization, whatever it is, continue to send the message that they need to divest. Look into it. And your personal stock portfolio, where your 401k is invested, look into that. You know, JP Morgan, Stanley Chase, they do a lot of that stuff. So look into those types of things. Um, so there, there's been a large divestment. Standing Rock, right now, they're they're still feeling the ramifications on the ground. Um, and it's going to take a long time to heal. And, you know, if you see your opportunity to help them in whatever way that is, whether that's a Lakota, a Lakota language project or another way that you see, you know, do, do continue to help people. Do continue to help them. Because they're still feeling the ramifications. And you go to North Dakota, I tell you what, the first time I saw a Martin County Sheriff when I went through Mandan, I had to stop and pull over because I was shaking and I was sweating. And they look for us, and I change out my I change out the vehicles that I drive. I go in North Dakota. They look for us. So there, that that's going to take a while to heal. So keep saying prayers. It's a uh, question from downstairs. Uh, from the people watching downstairs. Um, yeah. Uh, this is from downstairs. Um, can someone speak to the current state of gold mining in the Black Hills? Hashtag Black, Black Hills Not For Sale from Kelsey LPLP. They didn't disclose that when they did the permits um, in South Dakota as a, to do the, the exploratory mining. So they're, what they want to do is they want to have another homestake mine. And let me explain where they want to do this. There's an area in the Black Hills called the Peshla. In the Peshla area, um, the, the, the tribes got together, several tribes got together, those with a little bit more money got together and we bought Peshla because it was owned by an individual rancher and it had come up for sale and um, we bought it because it's very, very, very sacred to us. It was one of the areas that we would do uh, sun dance very, very long time ago and it's very, really sacred. So we bought it. Um, just. Outside of that, up in the tree line, is where they want to open up and do this huge open pit, um, gold mining, homestake mile type, homestake mining type of thing. What they're currently doing right now, what they want to do, is do up to 30 borehole testing to see what kind of gold deposits are there and where they want to go first. Um, they want to use water, and they want to use the same type of stuff to drill into those boreholes as is used in uh, fracking. And as you saw in the uh, uh, Rover pipeline spills, before the pipeline came in through, when they were drilling around Rover and all the sediment and stuff that happened on Rover pipeline in Michigan, they want to use that type of stuff. It's a really gritty, sandy, clay type stuff that just clogs everything. And fish can't live in it. It, it does, you, even microbes can't live in it. It's, it's, that, it's that type of thing. And um, so it's, there were three Cheyenne Rivers to 
tribal members this past week who live in Rapid City who filed for an injunction. That hearing is going to come up within the next couple weeks, whether we can stop them from doing that borehole drilling test uh, with those three people. So I can't go into, deal, into detail on some of the resistance planning that is currently happening because we are being very public right now. <laughs> But it is there, and the treaty councils are being consulted. Do we have one more question? I'm sorry, do you have something else? Yeah. Hi, my name is Lisa Milos, and I'm a, a, a union member. And I went to uh, Standing Rock. Um, I was only able to be there for four days in October. Um, and um, we brought supplies out there. But one of the main reasons uh, what happened when I went back was um, at the, uh, my union convention, we passed a resolution to divest uh, from our pension fund from energy transfer partners. Um, unfortunately, our unions, uh, our union in particular, the University of California, doesn't have control over the uh, pension fund. Um, but there was, um, there has been also a lot of movement on behalf of the students, uh, UC Fossil Free, and for many years, for like at least four years, who have been struggling to divest from the endowment fund and have been doing been very active along the state of California at different UC campuses. Um, and then two months after the resolution passed, and as a result, I believe, of the water protector struggle, um, UC um, divested about $200 million more from energy transfer partners. The chief investment officer uh, said it was both an economic decision as well as, as uh, a governance and, and social governance decision, uh, a human rights decision. But uh, the University of Professional and Technical Employees Union, we represent 15,000 workers in the UC system primarily. In, so my question though is that how do you see working with unions to bring more awareness about where our pension funds are going to? Because basically, we're financing our own destruction. And um, it's really important, this past, um, I believe a few months ago, we were at the San Francisco Union uh, Pension Plan meeting and it didn't go as well as planned. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of fighting going on, basically. The, you, there's some, some unions do not, do not support this. The building of trades, for example, there's this dichotomy, or this, just this, this false kind of dichotomy with, where it says, like, basically, uh, fossil fuel production produces jobs, supposedly. So how do you view, how do, how do you see us being able to work together to be able to bring more awareness in the union field, in the union area, because that's where I'm primarily interested in working and to be able to stop the money that's come, that's being put in by these enormous pension funds into the banks as well as into energy transfer partner and other uh, fossil fuel companies as well. Okay, <laughs> let's put on me. <laughs> So, um, thank you, Lisa. So here in the Bay Area, there has been a huge divestment movement that's branched onto not just us as in individuals, but we've, we've moved on to our actual cities. You know, thank you to Jackie Dozer um, for really bringing that here to San Francisco because she was inspired by Seattle, who divested from Wells Fargo in 2016 or 2017, I believe, um, because of, you know, Dapple, because of this fossil fuel. And they, they were like, you know, we don't need this anymore. Let's divest from this. And so right now, Seattle is working on, um, I believe they're working on a public bank system um, that's up there. And, you know, because of Seattle, here in San Francisco, we are working with San Francisco Retirement um, Board, you know, to get them to divest uh, from fossil fuels from, I think, Bank of America. Uh, it's five point, I think like $5.9 billion. It's a lot of money 
to divest. And, you know, the treasurers are literally trembling because of how much money that's invested in this. And this is something that we will talk about tomorrow, which I will talk about too, about our action, direct action that we are hosting um, right outside of the Wells Fargo headquarters, where we do have a lineup of many speakers uh, from Oakland Divestment Group, from Sacramento's Divestment Group, San Francisco's Divestment Group, you know, all these different coalitions have been created all because of what happened in Seattle. And what happened in Seattle was because of the standoff for DAPL. And just recently, um, you know, New York City divested billions of dollars from the fossil fuel industry. New York pension plan. Yes, their pension plan. The fifth largest in the country. The fifth largest. Exactly. And, you know, it's going to take us as individuals to come together to organize, to work with each other, to find out how we can create and pass legislations through, you know, our cities to let them know that, you know, we don't want, we don't want our retirement money to be invested in fossil fuel because we all understand that the fossil fuel industry, the coal mining industry, the nat liquefied natural gas industry is a die our dying industries. We can no longer depend on that. And we need to look toward renewable, sustainable, healthier energies that will truly benefit us as human beings, along with you know, our non-human relatives, the trees, the plants, the four-legged, the winged, the little critty crawlers, our insects that crawl underneath us, you know? And I'll pass it on to Joy. So I think she was specifically asking about unions. And so when there, there was actually a lot of union reps that came from San Diego. And one of my favorite kitchens was the Michigan kitchen because I could always get something to eat even at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and believe me, I worked till like 2 or 3 in the morning and then I'd hear Heidi Bear and, you know, before 6 in the morning. But Unions, when we start talking to the unions, we need to start talking about some of our shared history. And some of that shared history has to do with fighting the corporations, especially the ones that we're working for, or the ones that have an impact on us and our families. And unions went through a very turbulent part in history, and they had massacres that happened. And they had, you know, so, so much struggle that happened. And, and you know, their, their families were, were targeted, and people were killed, and people were assassinated, and children were left to go hungry. And so we need to talk about some of our shared types of struggles that are going on. And just as we do grassroots organizing within our communities, you need to think of that as your community. And so it is grassroots. It is visiting. It is reaching out. Just as you try to get that person to come to your union meeting, because I used to belong to unions, I know how hard, I know how hard that can be to get people to come to your union meeting. Um, so just as you do that, reaching out to them to, to, to come to your union meeting, say, well, these are some of the issues that we're talking about. There's some of the issues we're concerned about. And yeah, we are concerned about job security. I'm, I'm concerned about job security. I want to have energy jobs that are going to be long lasting and sustainable. And the fossil fuel industry is a dying industry. And even though President Chio Head <laughs> is going everything that he possibly can to extract every last bit of oil and coal and whatever else, squeeze that turn up as hard as he can, we need to squeeze back. Because if we don't, then they're not going to have jobs. And they're not going to have their retirement. 
So th that, that's how we need to work together. And, you know, reach out. Maybe there's somebody in one of the communities or one of the organizations that can come and speak. You know, and I'm sure we, we'd be glad to do that. So. So I now wanted to uh, thank you all for the questions. And uh, let's give a big O to our panelists here. Oh. So I wanted to let you all know about, oh, there's one more question? Oh, OK. Last one. Hi, I'm Rick from Europe. I'm from Holland. And mostly I'm uh, honored to be here with the Heroes of Standing Rock because you have made also the headlines and the evening news in Holland and uh, several times. So your fight is also pretty well known at the other side of the Atlantic. So I'm uh, part of a foundation that's called the Ocean Cleanup. And when the salmon goes nowadays into the ocean, it's uh, eating poisonous plastic and comes back as poison. And uh, starting from next month, we're going to build a gigantic machine, which is going to clean the, uh, the plastic out of the ocean mm -hmm. and make sure that the salmon, when they come back, they're healthy and as big and as numerous as they used to be. Wow. And therefore, I would like to invite everybody here, if you have time and you want to see this machine, you're more than welcome to join us in Alameda, where we're building it. And we're going to have three major events. First is 18th of April. And then two others, which are celebrated throughout the whole body, with lots of uh, uh, people, and everybody's invited to come over and have a look, and talk to us and see how we're going to clean the oceans, and uh, get the uh, salmon healthy, and numerous back as possible as they used to be.
The Argyle or Dave? No. No, no, no. No, Well, I think what you're really talking about is allyship and how people came with different agendas. And, and, and so, but that happens in every movement, and it's part of the it's part of the education. So there were people that came for all kinds of reasons. Some of them came because they really wanted to defend the, the water and that's what was moved them. Some of them didn't even know why they were there, just their spirit moved them to be there. Some of them came because of their ego. Some of them came because they suddenly realized they could be Facebook famous on Facebook Live. Some of them came because they found out, oh, we could do GoFundMe. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> it's the truth. And, yeah. and, and the, as many wonderful, positive, amazing things that happen, and there's so many stories that, you know, I'm never going to be able to go through, and it's getting close to the end of the time here. But there was also a, a really big curve, 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 learning curve, with, with learning to be an ally, and learning what that meant to be an ally. And, um, those those things are still in in the works, and it's going to be continuing. But one of the the greatest things that that happened was there was a lot of young people there. A lot of the young people learned how to be allies. Truly learned in their heart of hearts what it meant to be an ally. And those people are now walking everywhere else, and they've carried that fire on. And that's going to continue. That's going to spark other people. That it's carrying on that discussion and carrying on that education. And you know, I I personally thank everybody that came. It didn't matter to me what color you were. It didn't matter to me what background you were. I remember being around the fire, the sacred fire, and there was a Palestinian, and there was a person from Israel, and there was a person from Iraq. And there was people from Africa, and there was people from the Amazon, and we were all sitting around the fire laughing and joking and talking. And I just looked at all this, and I looked at everything that was happening, no matter what what was going on around. It was it was what was possible, and we lived it. So I know that it's possible. Thank you. So tomorrow, I'm really, really, really excited about tomorrow, you guys. You don't know how happy I am in my heart. So I don't know more. SFA had teamed up with Indigenous Environmental Network, thus why they are here. And we decided to organize a nonviolent direct action tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. till about 12 p.m. outside of the Wells Fargo headquarters because of their recent grant push of $50 million offering to Native people, Alaska Native people. And we're here to tell them that you cannot buy us out. We do not want your dirty money. You keep your dirty money. And we will continue to rise together and to not have anything to do with you through your corporation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take over the streets, which is on Montgomery, um, you know, just right off of the uh, Montgomery in California, I believe, right outside their headquarters, and paint this beautiful mural. I'm going to spoil it. It's going to be her. So, if any of you have seen the pictures of November 2017, mm -hmm. I don't know more SFA had organized um, and partnered up with um, Isaac Murdoch and Christy Belcourt,
who Isaac Murdoch had created that uh, Thunderbird woman. And uh, shout out to him. Thank you for all of that. And uh, we're, she's about 35 feet long. And it was such an honor to be able to cut out that outline. And we invite all of you who are here tonight, all of you downstairs, all of you watching on live stream to participate and, you know, take over the streets, come together and, you know, stand up for the water. Because, you know, the struggle that we're going through is a continuous thing. And we stand for the water, we stand for the land and for the air and for all of humanity. And we think about the next seven generations. And we think about what we can do in this moment that we're living together and how we can make it beneficial and sustainable for those who come after us. Oh. And so you can look on uh, the Facebook Idol No More SF Bay, that's spelled I-D-L-E, No More SF Bay, and you can check out the Facebook link. Uh, again, that's at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm very excited, to hopefully, to see you all and to paint the streets with you all. Um, and if you can't make it, then, you know, just check out the Facebook, like, pictures and all that stuff. And also a reminder about the round dance that's happening tomorrow with the uh, Native American Health Center. It's going to be held at San Francisco uh, State University. Um, the Facebook page is also up. There's also flyers in the, in the front, uh, by the front entrance that starts at 5.30. There's... Uh, dinner and other uh, opening ceremonies until 7 p.m. That's when the round dance actually starts. And um, last but not least, I would like all of the water protectors to stand up because I would like to honor you all and uh, give a big O and gratitude to you all. Yeah. Woo.